This week on the CNET Tech Review, new home theater gear from Sony and Panasonic. Use your PS3 to stream music and videos from your computer to your TV. The Chevy Cruze may put the brakes on your plans to buy a hybrid. And printing on the go, courtesy of HP. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. This week the good is all about video. Shooting video, playing it back, streaming videos, you get the idea. First up, a new Blu-ray player from Sony. Here's Matt Muscoviak with a first look. Hey, I'm Matthew Muscoviak at CNET.com, and we're going to take a look at the Sony BDP S580 Blu-ray player, which is currently selling for about $170. Like most players, it has a glossy black finish, and although you can't see any buttons from afar, there are actually a few little nubs along the bottom for basic functions like eject and play. There's also a handy USB port on the front, and there's even a second USB port around the back. The included remote has a simple design that we liked, and you can also control the player with Sony's remote app, which is available for both iOS and Android. The coolest thing about the app is that you can use the keyboard to search in streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Instant, which you can't do on any other player we've seen. The BDP S580 has the standard set of features we expect at this price, including built-in Wi-Fi and 3D Blu-ray support. It also has the most extensive suite of streaming media services of any Blu-ray player we've tested, including Netflix, Amazon Instant, Hulu Plus, Vudu, Pandora, and Slacker. While we love all the services, we weren't as thrilled with the way Sony's user interface displays them. Instead of the standard Netflix interface we've seen on all the other players, Sony has its own interface, and unfortunately the cover art is small, and sometimes it can be hard to read. The main user interface isn't that great either, especially when you have to scroll past tons of less popular services to get to something like Vudu. Now realm back you'll see the AV inputs including the HDMI output and the coaxial audio output. We put the player through our full series of image quality tests and it was an excellent performer. However, these days nearly every Blu-ray player has basically the same image quality, especially on Blu-ray movies, so it shouldn't be a big factor when you're making a buying decision. When we tested the speed of the player, we found the Sony is faster than the average 2011 Blu-ray player, especially when it comes to loading Netflix and navigating movies. However, it's not quite as fast as loading Blu-ray discs, so you'll want to look at the speedy Panasonic DMP BDT210 if you want fast load times. So overall, the Sony BDP S580 is a solid Blu-ray player with built-in Wi-Fi and more streaming services than all competing Blu-ray players that we've tested, but the trade-off is you'll have to put up with its clunky interface. I'm Matthew Muscoviak, and this is the Sony BDP S580. Of course, to really enjoy the picture quality of a good Blu-ray player, you need to have it connected to a good TV. And that's where this new set from Panasonic comes in. Very good. Here's David Katzmeyer with the details. Hi, I'm David Katzmeyer with CNET, and I'm sitting next to the Panasonic TCP55 VT30. Uh, this TV is also available in a 65-inch series. This is Panasonic's highest-end television for 2011. It's a lot of anticipation leading up to the release of this television. It's the successor to the editor's choice, our favorite TV from last year, the VT25. And uh, in most ways, this TV is a worthy successor. It's the best performing television we've tested so far this year. In terms of design, Panasonic went back to its one sheet of glass on this model. The uh, single sheet covers both the frame and the screen itself for a sleek, integrated look that we really do like. On the downside, it does have a thicker bezel than a lot of the other plasmas out there, namely the ones from Samsung, so the TV itself is less compact for the screen size, but all told, we do appreciate the thin depth as well. It's a lot thinner than last year's models. Feature-wise, the VT30 comes with all the bells and whistles. That includes one pair of 3D glasses. These are infrared glasses, unlike the Bluetooth used by Samsung. It does have a new power switch, however, so you can easily tell whether the glasses are turned on and off, and in general, we felt they kept the sync very well despite being infrared. The internet connectivity on this TV is also fully loaded. Panasonic includes a Wi-Fi dongle. There's no built-in Wi-Fi, but you can plug in the dongle and get Wi-Fi connectivity without having to pay extra. 
The VR Connect suite is the same as featured on lower end televisions. Panasonic includes Netflix and Amazon Video On Demand, although it doesn't have YouTube or Hulu Plus yet. We do really like the layout of Panasonic service. All the things are easy to reach, and you can arrange the thumbnails as you like. There's also a VR Connect marketplace that includes a few apps and a couple of $5 games from Gameloft, as well as some merchandise like 3D glasses and uh, USB keyboards and mice. Of course, prices on that marketplace are pretty high at the moment. Picture adjustments on the VT30 are extensive. There's a couple of THX modes, one for 3D and one for 2D. Those aren't very adjustable, but the custom mode is. It offers uh, more settings than any TV we've tested so far. Unfortunately, despite all those settings and custom, we weren't able to achieve as accurate as a, of a calibration as we hoped, but THX itself is pretty darn accurate to begin with, so we didn't miss them too much. As I mentioned at the top, the VT30 has the best picture quality of any TV we've tested this year. Its strength is excellent deep black levels, which are better than any of the other Panasonics we've seen this year. And also, although a little bit brighter than previous year's Panasonics, we don't expect that the TV's black levels will deteriorate, although we'll keep testing them and let you know if they do. Color accuracy on the VT30 in THX mode is extremely good, although not quite as good as some of the best we've seen. This TV also has the ability to handle 1080p24 sources correctly, and it also has an improved anti-glare screen. 3D performance of the VT30 was also very good, especially in THX mode, which had accurate colors and very good shadow detail. Crosstalk on this TV was relatively infrequent, although we did see a little bit more than we've seen on some of the best models. That's a quick look at the Panasonic VT30 series, and I'm David Katzmeyer. You know, you could actually just skip the Blu-ray part and still get most of the same services directly on your TV. But if you're going to spend that much on a TV, what's another couple hundred bucks? Unless, of course, you already have a PlayStation. Ever since it came out, the Sony PS3 has continued to be one of our top-rated Blu-ray players. But did you know that you can also use it to stream media from any computer on your home network? Here's the always helpful Sharon Vaknin to show you how. Hey, I'm Sharon Backman for CNET.com, here with a how-to that'll help you bring your tech full circle. I'm a tech junkie, so as much as I appreciate each one of my gadgets for what they are, I also like to see them working together. So today I'll show you how to stream music, photos, and videos from your Mac or PC to your PlayStation and onto the big screen. It's nice having everything in one place. First, make sure your PS3 is connected to your home network either wirelessly or hardwired with an Ethernet cable. Once you're connected, go to the Settings menu, Network Settings, and then head down to Media Server Connections, and make sure it's enabled. If you're on a PC, download and install the latest version of Windows Media Player. Launch the player and go to the Library menu and select Add to Library. Here, you'll be able to add folders you want your Windows Media Player and your PS3 to access. These settings will depend on where you store your media. Then go back to the library menu and select Media Sharing. Check the box next to Share Media. Wait a few seconds and your PS3 will show up. Click it, then Allow, and then OK. We'll get to what to do next on your PS3 in a moment, but first, here's how to get things set up on a Mac. Macs don't have onboard support for this feature, so you'll need to download an application called PS3 Media Server. There are lots of programs like it, but this was the only free one I found that does the same thing as the paid ones. Once it's installed, we'll need to tweak some of the settings. Go to Navigation slash Share Settings and uncheck everything in the thumbnail section. This means that thumbnails won't show up on your PS3, but it'll mean faster loading time. I also got errors when these options were enabled, so let's keep it safe and keep them unchecked. In the bottom section, you'll need to add the folders you want available on the PS3. I added my entire hard drive, but I also added shortcuts to my music folder, workout videos, and photos. Now head to Transcoding Settings and change the maximum bandwidth to 14 or 15. Zero means an unlimited bitrate, but that makes for a lot of lag during playback. A lower bitrate does lower the quality of your playback, but that's the trade-off. Also, if you don't have 5.1 surround sound hooked up to your TV, go up to Number of Audio Channels and change it to Stereo. Now make sure you're connected to Wi-Fi on your Mac, and then hit Save, then Restart HTTP Server. Now that we've got things set up on the back end, your media is ready to be streamed to your PS3. 
Go to your PS3 menu and head to Photos, Videos, or Music. Your computer should show up as one of the servers, but if it doesn't, hit Search for Media Servers. If it's still not showing up, double and triple check that you followed all my instructions to a T and that your PS3 and computer are on the same network. But if it does show up, then you're set. You'll need to be in the music menu to play music, in the video menu to play your videos, and in the photos menu to see your photos. For music, you have options for shuffling, skipping, repeating, and more when you press the triangle button when a song is playing. To keep the music playing in the background, hit the home button on your controller instead of O. And when you're viewing a photo, hit the triangle button to see a slideshow of your images. Use R1 and L1 to move forward or backwards. You can also copy your music, videos, and photos onto your PS3's hard drive by pressing the triangle when you're viewing a file. Just be aware of how much space you have left on your drive. If you're still getting stuttering while you're listening to music or watching videos, lower the bitrate in the settings we changed earlier. Again, this will lower the quality, but it beats not being able to watch at all. As always, if you have any questions, come talk to me on my Facebook page. And if you have any ideas or how-to questions, email howto at cnet.com. For CNET, I'm Sharon Backnan, and I'll see you on the interwebs. All that, and you can still get services like Netflix and Hulu on your PS3, no matter what TV it's connected to. And the best part? It actually plays games. Wrapping up our video extravaganza this week is this week's top five cameras. Not cameras for shooting photos, but still cameras that shoot great video, but still shoot photos too. Never mind. Brian can explain. Using a video camera to shoot video. Sounds reasonable enough, doesn't it? Except that's so 2009. I'm Brian Cooley with top five digital still cameras for shooting high-def video. According to the expertise of CNET's resident photo experts, Lori Grunin and Josh Goldman. Now, lots of cameras shoot HD video these days. For that matter, lots of smartphones do. But this list of cameras is going to make you put your camcorder on eBay. These are really good. Some are DSLRs, there's a hybrid in there, an advanced mega zoom. But I'm also going to show you some pocket camera favorites for HD video as well. So, let's get started. Number five is the Nikon D5100. No one thing about this camera is best in class. It's kind of a B student overall. But overall, it's real solid, does nothing real poorly, and exhibits relatively low autofocus noise when shooting video. I bet you didn't think about that until you got into this whole idea. Also, this camera can grab a long 20 minutes of high def video in a single gulp. That's pretty good. Number four is the Canon EOS Rebel T3i. Video and still image quality stands out on this guy as much as does the stupid Rebel name. But Canon Rebels have been great values from the beginning, and this one's right in there. And like many cameras in this list, it can shoot all the way up to 1080p and 30 frames per second. That's all you're ever going to need. Number three is the value king on the list. This is the Panasonic Lumix DMC FZ100. It's not a DSLR, and that lens doesn't come off bolted on there, but it's also not priced like a DSLR. Under 500 bucks, and it's got a 24x fixed zoom lens that can go wide enough for interiors or long enough for sports. Now this camera also shoots 1080p, but we found it's happier shooting slightly lower 720p, which still looks great in the high def world. And remember, under 500 bucks. Oh, and it's got a flip out LCD. Number two is also a Panasonic Lumix. This one is the DMC GH2. Now we're back into interchangeable lenses with this guy. And again, excellent video quality at 1080p and 24 frames per second, which is very filmic, by the way. Its sensor can actually do 1080 and 60 frames per second, really high-end stuff. But it records video in the AVC HD format, and that limits it back down to 24p. We also like the touchscreen interface on this camera, and you can shoot 30 minutes of continuous video, as long as you have enough battery life and storage capacity. Now, before I bring you to our number one, I promised you these. Three of our favorite point-and-shoot cameras for shooting high-def video. Little pocket guys. Now, these all max out at 720p, but they do a really good job within that resolution, which is no slouch. They fit in your pocket, of course. None of them exceed 400 bucks. 
and none of them scream, I'm shooting now, when you hold them, which can really help you grab some of the best impromptu movies. Okay, our number one best digital still camera for shooting high def video is the Canon EOS 5D Mark II. Yeah, I know you're saying, yeah, no kidding, it's pushing $2,700 without a lens. But this camera is still a steal for what it does. That's not a lot of money for something so good, they actually shoot parts of the new Hawaii 5 series with it. This is what the pros are using out there. It's got a full frame sensor, a stunning lens system to choose from, and it's built like a rock. You can actually call this an investment and not be wishfully thinking. Okay, to see all the digital camera reviews from today's list and many others, just go to CNET.com, click on Digital Cameras. Thanks to Lori and Josh and our digital imaging team. And for more videos like this, go to top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. So now you're ready to pick up your camera, start shooting videos, put them on your computer, and stream them to your TV when you're not busy watching Blu-rays or playing games, of course. Phew. I feel like I accomplished something this week. Yay, me. But we're not done yet. It's time to take a break, but we will be back for more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good. All right, this one has nothing to do with video. It's all about the written word, or more specifically, the printed word. If you work with a lot of documents and often find yourself out on the road with nowhere to print them, it might be time to invest in one of these babies. If you're a traveling professional that needs the convenience of a portable printer that really won't take up much room in your carry-on luggage, well, this device is your answer. I'm Justin Yu, Associate Editor for CNET.com. This is your first look at the HP OfficeJet 100 mobile printer. So the goal of any mobile device is to pare down the machine to its smallest possible form, and the Mobile 100 is just small enough to fit into a briefcase or carry-on bag. The paper input tray at the bottom and the cover for the dual ink cartridges both fold neatly into the body of the printer. And it weighs about the same as a 15-inch Apple MacBook laptop, and that's with the lithium-ion rechargeable battery installed. So you can print on a number of different kinds of paper types and sizes, thanks to the adjustable slider here. You can use the standard 8.5 by 11 sheet piece of paper, or you can also go down to a 3 by 5 inch index card. HP makes things even more convenient by adding built-in wireless Bluetooth, and they encourage you to use it by not putting a USB cord in the box, so if you want a wired connection, you'll have to buy your own. You can also print using the picked bridge USB port on the back, but HP strangely removes the media card slot that we saw on previous models, which is a little bit inconvenient, but this two-ink cartridge printer is made for office documents and not quite so much photos anyway, so we won't complain too much. The HP OfficeJet 100 may cost more than your average single function printer, but it makes improvements over previous models with a sleek design and improved output quality. Also, the rechargeable battery and Bluetooth wireless give you the freedom to leave those messy cords at home and travel light. So if your business depends on outputting jobs on the road, the HP OfficeJet 100 Mobile definitely deserves your attention. You can read more details like speed and quality test results in our full review on CNET.com. But that's going to do it for me. I'm Justin Yu. You just took a first look at the HP OfficeJet 100 mobile printer. Thanks for watching. Okay, that's what they're calling a mobile printer these days? I guess briefcases are a lot bigger than I thought they were. And with that, let's move on to the bad. If you're like me, you cannot stand having half a dozen keys sitting quietly in the bottom of your purse all day. Oh wait, that doesn't bother me at all. So I guess I won't be needing the key port slide then. If you're like me and you don't like sharp metal objects jingling around in your pocket, scratching up your phone and ripping holes in your pants, you may be looking for a way to manage your keychain. I'm Antoine Goodwin and I've got a product here that can help you tame your wild keychain and up to six keys. It's called the keyport slide. Now the ordering process for the keyport slide involves ordering the slide unit itself, which is made of anodized aluminum, and up to six keyport blades. These blank keys can then be taken to your local locksmith to be cut to duplicate your keys, which means you won't have to send your whole keychain off the keyport. You then load these six blades into the slide and voila, you've got your entire keychain in one rather solid block. If you've got less than six keys to replace, 
You can also order accessory blades that add a 4 gigabyte USB drive, a bottle opener, or an LED flashlight to the Keyport Slides mix. If you lose your slide, the unit is etched with a unique identifier that can be registered at MyKeyPort.com with a reward giving a good Samaritan both incentive and the means to return the unit to you. That's pretty cool, but at 50 bucks for the slide unit, $5 for each blade, accessory blades starting at 6 bucks, plus the cost of having your keys locally duplicated, it's also a pretty big investment. Check out our complete evaluation of the Keyport slide over on CNET.com to see if we think it's worth it. Until then, I've been Antoine Goodwin with CNET, giving you your first look at the Keyport slide. So let me get this straight. It's expensive, it's only good for a few items, it probably won't work with many modern car keys, and oh yeah, it's expensive. I'm gonna go ahead and stick to one of these. Totally fine. Let's wrap things up with this week's bottom line. Ryan Cooley's back with a look at the 2011 Chevy Cruze Eco Edition, which might make you rethink whether it's time to get a hybrid. It's a Chevy that might make you forget imports, not to mention hybrids. Let's drive the 2011 Chevy Cruze Eco and check the tech. The 40 plus MPG Club is rarefied air, and this is one of its few members. 42 MPG on the highway, that's better than a smart 4.2, yet in a car that holds two times as many people. But the technology in this guy mostly lives under the hood, not in the dash. Now yes, we're driving a skinny, lean, green eco car, but the car makers all know you don't want the car to feel that way when you're in it. So in here is a nice cabin. GM and Ford and Chrysler have all been doing nice interior materials for a while now, pretty much without exception. And this guy shows that. Nice different textures, uh, good surfaces. Whether you like this sort of Darth Vader mask design is a matter of taste, but everything is done well and feels solid, with the one exception of this very strange dash panel, seat insert, and door insert material, which I think is just stock on an Eco and looks like a whore's drawers got stretched all around you. Not real big on that. Here's your display. It's the only one you're ever going to see. There's no big color LCD nav available on this car, so you're going to have this more basic uh, sort of LCD monochrome deal. It shows your AM and FM radio, your XM radio, no HD on this guy. Your other media options include a CD player here, and then we've got an optional aux and USB under a tidy little door right there in the console. And the sound comes out of six speakers of indeterminate type and wattage. It's straightforward on that, and there's no upgrade on the factory build sheet. Now, without navigation, yes, but with navigation, yes. What I mean is you've got OnStar directions and connections. That means this comes stock, as just about every GM car does, with the ability for you to call OnStar here, get directions, and they'll be downloaded to the car, and you'll see them right down here on that helper screen. Basic directions. You can also make cell phone calls here. This is a calling service but bring your phone. We have Bluetooth hands-free on this guy. That is part of an option package, not standard. And that same package rolls in uh, cruise control you see here and also audio controls in the steering wheel. Bunch of stuff you probably want, so check that one off. Now note the shifter. Yes, it's a six-speed manual. That's kind of your preferred default gearbox on this guy. They've got a big green dot around the six, the overdrive. That's always overdrive on every manual gearbox I know, but they call it eco gear, which I guess is just a taller overdrive. On the freeway at 60, it's turning about 1,800 RPM. Okay, now, Cruise Eco has got a very special motor. It's a little thing, and it's turbocharged. 1.4 liter side saddle inline four. It delivers 138 horsepower, 148 diminutive foot-pounds of torque, although being a turbo motor, that torque's kind of an elevated number, so that really helps. Zero to 60 is like a 10.2 second affair. This car is not about being fast. MPG is what it is all about. 28 city, 42 highway with the six-speed manual with the eco gear. Unless you get the automatic, then you get a hell of a haircut on the highway MPG. It comes down to 37. Let's look at some of the technologies they're using here. If you look in the very back, you can see the electric power steering rack. That takes drag off the engine. Here's the turbo down here. and Notice it's integral in the exhaust manifold. Lighter, smaller, cheaper. Now down here in the lower grill, you've got some louvers that shut, I think during highway speeds or when you're at cruising, because that cuts down some of the air disturbance flowing through the car. 
And over here in the wheel wells, we're taking a look at ultra low rolling resistance tires. All of this adds up to the package that puts the Eco ahead of a standard cruise. Oh, yeah, and don't forget the weight. They shave 200 pounds off this guy over a similarly engined base cruise. <laughs> Okay, what's it like driving a 1.4 liter turbo in a decent sized car? It's actually pretty good. Uh, you never get this feeling of brawn. It needs to be stroked and spun up all the time, but that's just turbo motors for you, especially small displacement ones. The power comes on very smoothly, feels pretty linear. Turbo lag is less of an issue here than in some bigger engines with turbos I've driven. The car feels like it's hewn from an ingot of aluminum. I'm very impressed by the build quality and the overall balance. You know, for a tail dragger, it's got really nice road manners. It's not a performance car, but I'm on a twisty canyon road here, some off camber sort of turns, some of them are decreasing radius, and only when you push it pretty hard do you feel those low rolling resistance tires kind of balleting around a little bit, but not badly, not for the kind of car it is. I really enjoyed driving it. I found it was just kind of fun and Energizing is the right word. The electric power steering is really nicely calibrated. It doesn't have any sort of any sort of what switch in that some electric systems seem to have where you feel it kind of get lumpy or weird at places. This one's always kind of linear and smooth. The only thing I don't like is this shift light. It's quite bright and it gets your attention and it's stupid. I don't like its advice. If you follow that light's advice, you're driving around at 1300 RPM all the time even when you're going up a grade. I mean, it's, it's just stupid. It lugs the engine all the time. So I wish I could turn that stupid thing off. But if you got to live with it, you got to live with it. And of course, the great option on this car is that if you happen to be driving along and you meet a prostitute on the side of the road who's missing her underwear, you can fashion her a new pair from the dashboard. No other car I know does that. Okay, pricing. Now, unlike a lot of hybrids, the Cruze Eco starts cheap and eats cheap. 19.2 to buy the car, and of course, the MPG is great. Couple of packages you want to throw on it to get it CNET style. Well, sort of. One's called the convenience package. That's going to give you backup sensors, remote start, and power driver seat adjustments. A few of them, anyway. The other one is a connectivity package. It's only like five and a quarter, and for that you get a whole lot of features. The USB in the console, steering wheel audio controls. That's where you get Bluetooth hands-free. Also, is that package, and it also rolls in cruise control. That's about it for teching this guy up. But you can do a lot in the aftermarket with the money you're going to save on gas. The bottom line this week, why can't Eco be cooler? I mean, the cruise isn't going to win any prizes for design, and you better know how to drive a stick if you really want to save every last drop of gas. But okay, okay, it's good for the Earth. And that is good, actually, considering that the world's weather seems to be showing us that we could use a few more eco-friendly vehicles. All right, folks, that's our show. We'll be back next week with a brand new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.